Good afternoon. My name is Jason Blazakis. I am a senior research fellow at the SUFAN Center. And it's a great pleasure to be with you all today. I'll be your MC for the next six sessions. And in our next fireside chat, we will return to the unfolding situation in Afghanistan. This session is titled, Qatar's Political and Diplomatic Efforts on Afghanistan. And it will focus on Qatar's role in addressing the critical political challenges facing Afghanistan today. Mr. Peter Bergen is Vice President for Global Studies and Fellows at New America. And he is also a New York Times best-selling author many times over. And he will be interviewing His Excellency, Dr. Mutlaq bin Majid al Qatani, the Special Envoy of the Foreign Minister of the State of Qatar for Counterterrorism and Mediation of Conflict Resolution. Ambassador Mutlaq al Qatani has held the post of Special Envoy of the Foreign Minister for Counterterrorism and Mediation, a post he has held for five years. He previously served as the Director of the Department of International Organizations at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and he holds extensive expertise in the field of counterterrorism, anti money laundering, and terrorism financing. And he has a leading role in shaping Qatar's. CVE and PVE initiatives in the region. Peter, the floor is yours. Ambassador, thank you for uh, agreeing to do this interview. And so how did the Qatari government become involved in uh, this whole issue in Afghanistan with the Taliban. What's your personal role been? Well, thank you very much. Uh, I would like uh, first uh, to share with you a, a piece of information about uh, our role in, in Afghanistan. Uh, in 2001, just immediately after the, the invasion uh, of the US to Afghanistan, we were approached by, uh, by the United Nations and some Western powers to, uh, to to take part in this, to bring peace, or just to host uh, a conference, uh, a peace conference in Afghanistan. Uh, the leadership at that time, we said, no problem the principle, just we had uh, a small request uh, to make, if we may. And the request why to have inclusive peace conference. And uh, our partner at that time was wondering what we were referring to by saying inclusive peace conference. And we said for all Afghans. And the question was, are you referring to Taliban? He said, we said yes, as long as they are uh, Afghans. So uh, the offer was not taken seriously. And then the uh, 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 international community or the Americans and others went to Bonn, build that big tent and have that conference 2001 uh, in, in Germany, and then in 11 days, uh, uh, the government was, was imposed at that time. Uh, since then, uh, we felt, one, that maybe the process was not inclusive enough. Second, uh, 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 there is no military solution uh, to the crisis in Afghanistan, and the only way is through a, a genuine, uh, peaceful, and through negotiations. Uh, till 2010 or 9 or 11, uh, we saw that there is a shift in the United States policy towards Afghanistan and towards a negotiation. Then we have been approached uh, by our American uh, partners at that time, and then since then we uh, opened channels uh, with Taliban and we started gradually to engage them until we reached 2013 when we tried to open this political office in Doha. And then from 2013 till 2018, there was some talks, but was not quite genuine talks till October 2018 when we started the talks between the Americans and the Taliban. And then in January 2019, we started drafting the first elements of uh, of what became a Doha a Peace Agreement in 2020. 29th of February 2020, we signed the agreement between the United States and the Taliban, and then 
September 12, 2020, also we start the intra fund negotiations and we still continue actually to do and to play this role. And what are those inter-Afghan negotiations? What, how do they stand now? Well, uh, uh, as, 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 as the Doha agreement uh, uh, stated, that there are four elements of the Doha agreement, the counterterrorism, withdrawal, intra-Afghan negotiations, and comprehensive uh, and permanent ceasefire. We, when we reached to that point, which are the inter afghan negotiations, uh, we felt that uh, the process was moving forward. Uh, there was some kind of reluctance from one side. Uh, we tried to engage the other side, and, and we continue actually to facilitate the talks between the two sides. Ultimately, uh, uh, I think the world actually caught by surprise when the, the, the former president of Afghanistan fled the country, and since then, uh, the process, as far as the inter afghan negotiations is concerned, uh, just uh, interrupted. So there was a moment when there might have been an agreement, if President Ghani had stayed, you think there might have been an agreement that would have involved some kind of transitional government? Well, I would, uh, would suggest uh, so, because uh, during, uh, towards the end, I would say uh, Ju July, end of July, beginning of August, uh, we heard there's some kind of uh, maybe more readiness from uh, the side of the government uh, uh, to engage in a, in, in a, in a, in a kind of a dialogue to that effect just one night or two nights uh, before the collapse of the system, but maybe it was, it was too late to achieve uh, such objective. And you mentioned the agreement that was uh, February, uh, that was signed in February. Uh, it was about separating from Al-Qaeda, negotiating with the Afghan government, ceasefire, um, not attacking the United States forces. Did the Taliban stick with the agreement, or to what extent were the Taliban observing the agreement? Well, uh, I think this is a quite important question. I'm glad you brought this up. Uh, as far as the counterterrorism is concerned, I think they have been committed, and they are committed as far as our recent even discussions and talks with them. They are committed to uh, combat terrorism. They are committed, uh, committed to, uh, to uh, defeat and fight uh, Daesh. And they are committed not to allow Afghanistan soil to be used by terrorist individuals or terrorist organizations. And I think uh, many would uh, concur and acknowledge the kind of uh, uh, achievement or their vigorous uh, engagement uh, uh, with us and uh, with other countries uh, to fight uh, Daesh, which I think is a, is a common objective to all of us. Uh, second, uh, as far as the, the withdrawal and not to attack United States or the American soldiers or uh, since the signing of the Doha Agreement till the withdrawal, uh, they uh, did deliver and they were committed not to attack the U.S. troops and to uh, secure an uh, environment or enable environment for a safe uh, withdrawal from, from Afghanistan, and that's uh, exactly what happened. Uh, with respect to, uh, to the permanent and comprehensive ceasefire, I think, yes, there is a, now a ceasefire, uh, by default, maybe. But with respect to the inter afghan negotiations, I think the, the, the process actually stopped because the president, the former president, fled the country. Otherwise, that would have uh, continued. So uh, I would say, in general, Yes, uh, they, uh, they uh, are in compliance uh, with the Doha Agreement, uh, but that also we need to see them to continue you know, to comply and to implement uh, uh, Doha Agreement. What they said recently with our discussions with them that they want also all sides to, to, to comply uh, with the Doha Agreements because there are other details and more details uh, in the Doha Agreement which requires uh, you know, certain obligations from all sides uh, uh, to be met. What about the fact that Siraj Akhani, who's now the Minister of the Interior, is described by the United Nations as having some kind of role in Al-Qaeda? Is that a problem? Or? Uh, 
do you think? Well, I think uh, I would say there is no wise uh, government or regime would associate itself with uh, terrorist organizations or terrorist individuals. Uh, and uh, I hope this is not the case. Yeah. Um, so what role did you personally play? You've been doing this for six years now. I mean, tell us a little bit about how, you, how do you facilitate these discussions? What's your role? Well, uh, uh, actually, we're not only hosting uh, the talks because we do understand that having uh, two uh, parties or opponents or conflicting parties without uh, genuine facilitation or mediation, a process like that uh, is bound uh, to fail. So we recommended this, quite frankly, from the beginning uh, to the parties that if you want this process to succeed, you need to have a uh, a mediator, a mediator with certain credibility, with certain understanding of the cultural sensitivities, uh, a mediator that understands the issue and will uh, play a role in a, in a quite impartial, with foreign dignity and respect to international law. That's why having all these criteria and these uh, principles and values which helped us actually in, in, in facilitating the talks between uh, between between the U.S. and and Taliban, of course, I was telling my 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 my, my colleagues, it's, it's maybe uh, you think uh, you got educated in the West, it will be easy for you to mediate a conflict like this, or you think you are a Muslim Sunni, relatively maybe more or less have similar culture to the Afghans, you would be able to uh, to facilitate this very easily. But I found it quite uh, challenging, quite fascinating. It's quite unique experience, but what that actually what I learned from that that a mediator you want to mediate the conflict you need to be mindful of this cultural sensitivities from both sides. You need also to be adaptable, resilient, uh, flexible, uh, and 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 you and you 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 basically you learn uh, 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 by working uh, closely with them. Uh, it was, as I said, uh, we facilitated the talks, we mediated the talks, we hosted the talks, and we engaged in a shuttle diplomacy between not only these, the, the two parties, but also uh, with the Afghan government and with certain regional uh, powers and key players in the region because, uh, unfortunately, we realized that Afghanistan uh, there are many external elements that uh, shaped, I would say, Afghanistan uh, future, or uh, uh, and uh, which which we found ourselves in, in a way that we need to to deal with these uh, with these countries, especially uh, the neighboring countries. The um, do you have any? So you mentioned the inter-Afghan negotiations. They they stopped after President Ghani left the country. Is there any indication they may start again? Are you trying to facilitate that? Well, what we are, what we are saying to the Taliban, uh, which is the caretaker government, the de facto authorities in Kabul, uh, uh, discrimination and uh, exclusion, and this is not a good policy, uh, at least to start with a non-discriminatory uh, government, uh, maybe at later stage, inclusive government, a government that embrace the and uh, mindful of the diversity uh, of the country. And I think there are a lot of talented people who are not necessarily from Taliban. I think it's in the interest of Taliban to engage others. Again, this will be an internal process. This is, has nothing to do with uh, external powers, and we are not actually part of external, internal discussions among the Afghans. Uh, I think we should leave it for them to decide their future, and I think this is one of the mistakes that, we, well, that was made in the past. Uh, certain countries would like to impose a certain system or certain regime uh, external uh, uh, power to to the to the uh, to the up to, to Afghanistan, and uh, we found and we see, and uh, history actually tells us that uh, imposing external solution is not going to work with the Afghans. So that's why we want this to be to be dealt and to be handled by the Afghans themselves. What are the circumstances under which the Qatari government would recognize the Taliban government? I mean, you mentioned they're a caretaker government. Is the, are, are you waiting for something to happen before you recognize them? Are you not going to recognize them? Well, I see, uh, well, first, uh, in the past, 
only three countries uh, recognized the Taliban. And, uh, and Qatar and was not one of them. Qatar was not one of them. <clears throat> Uh, and this is a sovereign decision to decide by, by all nations, up to each country to decide. Uh, second, uh, people and international law speaks about recognition of states as opposed to recognition of governments. Now, mm. uh, it's, it's, we, uh, we think this is not a priority. What's more a priority as we speak now is the humanitarian, is the education, is uh, 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 free passage of passengers. Uh, there is a lot of issues which we think is quite important, but as a matter of reality, uh, there is a, a de facto authority in, in, in Afghanistan, and quite uh, frankly, they have been so cooperative with us in terms of uh, 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 allowing and facilitating uh, the travel of uh, foreigners and passengers, and they have been so cooperative also, not only in allowing or securing a free passage of passengers, but also with respect to the humanitarian assistance. Now, I see maybe it's a matter of time, but I see more countries now are engaging uh, uh, with, with the Taliban or a caretaker government or the de facto authorities, whatever you want to call them. It's a reality that we need to, to deal with. Uh, we saw two days ago the Americans and, uh, and, uh, and the Afghans met in Doha on the 9th and the, and the 10th of October. And from the statement that issued by both sides that the meeting was quite positive and constructive and uh, the Afghan side was highly candid and professional uh, in their discussions. Uh, I just left uh, a meeting between uh, European countries and other countries and Western countries. Uh, just as we speak, there are still, the meeting is still ongoing here in one of the uh, places here in Doha. And I see people are quite engaging with them, regardless actually whether, it's, uh, whether uh, there is a need to uh, really to recognize them at this point or not. Uh, I think uh, engaging with them is, 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 is the most important now, and if we are going to, uh, uh, to disengage or not to engage with them, I think, again, we are committing the same mistake that we did in 1989. When we washed our hand out of Afghanistan, when we abandoned Afghanistan, the Afghan people, and one of the consequences of that action is the 9-11. So I think we should learn from this. Also, otherwise, there are other countries who are more willing, maybe, uh, maybe an advanced stage now, talking to the Taliban and to the, the authorities in Kabul. So I think we should make up our mind whether to engage with them for the good cause or not. I think we have common interests, we have common uh, uh, challenges, we have common priorities. Uh, education, uh, women, girls' education, uh, human rights, women's rights, uh, humanitarian assistance. Uh, we have a lot of uh, challenges and the priorities and concern, and more importantly, to have a unity to fight uh, Daesh, which I think is, is, is a threat to all of us. You mentioned the Taliban and the Americans have been meeting over the last couple of days, and also Europeans and the Taliban have been meeting just today. What are the main issues that are, that are, that are being discussed? Well, the main issue is, is uh, first, is uh, uh, humanitarian assistance. Uh, free passage of movement or passengers, um, uh, uh, human rights, uh, women's rights, and basically the right to work, and girls' education, uh, and counterterrorism. And there is some kind of discussion about inclusive uh, uh, government and to what extent uh, that should be inclusive. And obviously, Qatar has played a key role in uh, getting people out. Can you, of Afghanistan, who want to leave, can you describe what Qatar's role has been and give us some specifics about the numbers of people that have come out, what exactly you've done. I was at a meeting, uh, at a meeting in Washington with the American University of Afghanistan. They announced publicly that Doha and Qatar is going to uh, have a, set up a campus. I think this was just on Wednesday, this announcement came out uh, for, for the American University of Afghanistan. So can you talk in specifics about exactly what Qatar has been doing uh, and what you plan to do? Well, actually, what happened, uh, uh, we, uh, we utilized the kind of a trust that we had uh, with, uh, with the Taliban, uh, not to serve certain countries, but to serve humanity. 
And I think that was, uh, that was, uh, that was what happened was, uh, I'm not going to comment on whether the evacuation was the right thing or not, but I think there was a necessity and we had to you know, stand behind our partners, our friends and allies, and that's what we did. Uh, there was a, a, a kind of situation was quite a, a chaotic, and, uh, and we thought we should, uh, if, uh, since, we, since we have the ability uh, and the trust by all sides, why don't we help? And we found ourselves in an in a, in a, in a evacuation exercise, which which uh, I've never seen and uh, maybe we'll never, hopefully we'll never uh, imagine something like this would happen uh, in the future. Uh, it was extremely challenging. It was not, it was not easy. And uh, during uh, uh, like uh, last month or so, I even went to Kabul three times uh, before the completion of the drawal. I was after that, even uh, luckily we escaped this explosion on the 26th of August. Uh, uh, also during, before, during and after the formation of the government, also the flights that we also uh, uh, managed to have after we got the airport operational. So it was a massive uh, exercise. Uh, and now uh, around maybe 60,000 more or less. And that was, uh, that was, uh, that was quite, a, quite a huge thing to do. So 60,000 came to Doha? Just up to maybe around, yes, 58,000, 60,000 uh, came to Doha and through Doha to their respective uh, destinations. And how many are still here? Uh, I don't have the figure with me, uh, but uh, those who are in Doha, they are, are in, are in uh, excellent, I would say, uh, uh, facility and accommodations. Uh, of course, they are not going to stay forever. They are here for a reason, and they will. Uh, uh, they are just. W we are working out uh, uh, their uh, their uh, uh, their travel again to their final destinations. And just a, the ones that came to Doha, did they have visas to go elsewhere, or just they, they just came and you're going to? They're working it out now. Well, I would say the majority, yes. Uh, that was uh, in, during the evacuation period. Uh, but uh, most of them, uh, their situations are sorted out. But those who came after we got the airport, Kabul International Airport operational, uh, all of them, if not most of them, have uh, uh, passport and proper documentations. So, and we, we, we do the screening and we do everything back in Kabul and also in Doha. So I think there is no issue whatsoever with those who are in Doha as we speak now. So looking forward, you know, the Taliban made, they appointed the government. The, the, there were 33 appointments, they were all Pashtun. So, uh, two members of the Akhani family, you know, it was a very hard line government. And then they added another round of cabinet officials that included an Uzbek and one or two minorities. The makeup of the Taliban government right now looks very much like the Taliban government before 9-11. In fact, it includes some of the same people. Do you think it's going to be a different kind of government? Uh, is there evidence that they've changed? What is it? What is, what's the evidence? Yes, I had this conversation with them. Yeah. And I think uh, I'm not going to judge to what extent what they said is compelling or not. But they put forward like uh, five arguments. Uh, number one, they said, you are, going, you are asking us to uh, uh, accommodate some individuals who had their chance in the past. It is not fair to, to, to have them in our cabinet. Second, they said, you are also, there, are, there are some names that maybe the West or others are recommending, and those people also had their term and chance in a corrupt government. So how do you want us to bring people who, are, who, had, uh, who have been corrupt? Third, we do not intervene in your uh, formation of government. So why do you intervene in our formation of government? This is not fair. Uh, and how do you think it's possible to have uh, inclusive government or unity government while we just, uh, we have been in war like uh, for 20 years and we are just in a government for a month or so. So how do you think this is possible to have uh, inclusive uh, government that's acceptable to everyone? What they said, this is a transitional period, so we need some times. And, and, and nevertheless, 
we are now accumulating non-Taliban to the governments, as you rightly indicated, just not the first announcement. In the second announcement, they added more professors, more doctors, and non-Taliban and from other ethnic uh, minorities like the Uzbeks and the Tajiks, and then Hazara or the Shiite also, they are also part of, uh, of their government. We hope uh, that they can also uh, appoint uh, women because uh, their role is indispensable to the Afghan society. And we told them this is Qatar as a model, as a Muslim country. Now we have uh, uh, women uh, assuming great responsibilities. We have uh, judges, we have uh, ministers, we have, uh, uh, you know, all of our, all of our different perspectives. So why don't you just you know, be mindful of this because this is a quite important for the society and for the Afghan. If you think this is a from religious perspective, this is not acceptable, we disagree with you. Well, the Prophet Muhammad, peace, be, peace upon him, he was encouraging Muslims, followers, to allow women and asking women and men to work and also to think, to contemplate, to educate themselves. So what Islam requires you requires us as a Muslim to allow women to work and to allow women and girls also to education. And these are the issues that we are also uh, 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 speaking uh, with them about. But honestly, at the end of the day, this is, this is a, a sovereign decision that they decide. It's not up to us to decide or to impose what we think is the right thing. Uh, and again, in the last 40 years or so, one of the, one of the mistakes that uh, that, that the world actually did, we were not quite mindful uh, of the cultural, social, political dynamics in Afghanistan. And I think we should give them uh, 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 space, we should give them room, uh, but also we should continue to engage with them uh, because uh, we have common objective. It's to have Afghanistan more peaceful and more stable. And I hope one day, that Afghanistan and the farm people will have more prosperity. Of course, you, you can't impose any form of government on any other government. But when you raise these issues about women with uh, the Taliban, what do they say? Well, um, it's, it's, this is a very sensitive issue yeah. for them. Uh, but uh, I came to the conclusion that as a Muslim, and also coming from Qatar, I think this has nothing to do with Islam. Yeah. Uh, to, if this is the case to prevent girls from going to school, or women preventing them from going to work, which I think this is the, the core issues now. Girls go to school, women go to work. Um, I, don't, I didn't see if this is a, has a religious background behind it. And it's also realized that this has nothing maybe to do with the culture itself. Uh, and because speaking to many Afghans, including maybe some of the Taliban's, maybe they have different uh, uh, view on, 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 on whether this has to do with the culture or not. Uh, I think this is a, a, an internal issue. Uh, I, see, I think they, 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 they are debating it, maybe. But maybe they, there are other reasons that we don't understand. So we, we want to understand from them what, is, what are the challenges so we can work, work it out together uh, with them. Were you surprised by how quickly the Taliban took over? Well, uh, I was really surprised not how quickly the Taliban uh, took this, but I was surprised by how the international or foreign intelligence underestimated uh, or, or was not ready to foresee or to predict or anticipate uh, something like this. I will give you like a, a kind of conversation I had with one of my Western colleagues. That was on August the 12th. Uh, well, I told him, uh, I think the game is over and the country is collapsing. And he told me, no way. <laughs> and he told me what we think it's, maybe we need another 90 days or maybe four months or others will say it's six months uh, for, the, for the government to collapse. So I told them, I think maybe by the end of August it will collapse, and that was the 12th of August. Uh, but I think both of us are proven wrong. It just took 
three days uh, uh, to collapse. Maybe the Taliban was surprised. Maybe the Taliban caught by surprise because uh, that was not the intention to go to, to, to go to Kabul on August 15th, at least not before 9-11. That's what we, what we understood. But what happened happened. Now we, are in a, we have a new rea reality that we need to, uh, to deal with. The, um, are there certain, you've spent six years negotiating with the Taliban. Who, uh, which of the Taliban negotiators has played the most important role and you know, how do you see that playing out in this next phase? Well, I, I cannot tell you uh, which person because uh, 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 they are coming as a group uh, with certain authority and they have certain instruction. Uh, uh, but what I, I can tell you, uh, the more you engage with them, the more they, uh, uh, they understand and they uh, become more cooperative. So I think those who, come, who came to Doha spent some time in, to in Doha. Uh, met with all the visitors from abroad and Western uh, colleagues and ambassadors and diplomats. Uh, those who visited uh, certain countries in the region and beyond. Those who spent like years with our American uh, friends. Uh, I think that had a, a positive impact on, on, on their thinking. So uh, I would say uh, just uh, more engagement with them uh, would, be, would, 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 would be helpful, I would say. Because they see with their own eyes that in Doha there are female ministers and female, I mean, it's, it must have had an effect on them being here, just being here for so long, seeing a different country, an Islamic country that has a culture which is not letting, you know, which allows women to work and get women to be educated. Do you think that has had any impact on them? Uh, I hope so. Yeah. Uh, uh, but still, I don't know how that will be, uh, will be so effective, but uh, I hope, and maybe it's a matter of time, but we need to continue to engage with them and not to just uh, uh, acknowledge or endorse uh, any kind of mistreatment to women or girls. One final question. Do they ask you to refer to them as, as the Islamic Emirate? Is that something that they want to be, are they, because this is an important point, right? What the government is called. Well, they can call themselves whatever one they call, they call, they call right. themselves. Uh, uh, you, you have no say or you no, you no right to, to the way I want to, uh, to name my country. Uh, but maybe the name itself has certain misperception, uh, which I think is really uh, uh, is causing all these difficulties. Um, uh, they said there are some countries that's called Emirates. Uh, there are some countries have the title Islamic, uh, and, and also this is Afghanistan, uh, and uh, this is the kind of argument they are making. But we are saying there are some Muslim countries that the names of the countries has nothing to do with the religion itself. So uh, maybe rebranding is, is, is something that's good that you look into, but the most important is uh, the way you interact with the world. Now you are having certain responsibility as a, as a de facto authority. You have certain responsibility obligations uh, to discharge. You should not look at yourself as a, as a militias or movement or Taliban. You should be more responsible and act with the international community in a way that to bring peace, security, stability uh, to your country. And sorry, one other question. You mentioned the word movement. The Taliban is a movement, now it's a government. Do you think they're gonna be able to function as a government if they, you know, I mean, they need to deliver services, water, electricity, banking. Do they understand that they need that? Otherwise, there's gonna be this humanitarian catastrophe. The UN says 14 million people are maybe going hungry this winter in Afghanistan. Uh, I, I hope they understand. Uh, well, well, apparently, they do understand but they cannot do things by themselves. They need more collaboration and more cooperation and more assistance from other countries. And this is the only way forward. Uh, uh, they got to engage with the world. The world should engage with them. And uh, the cooperation is the solution, I guess. 
Well, Ambassador, thank you very much for your time, for your insights, and also for all the valuable work you are you know, bringing some measure of peace and uh, order to Afghanistan. That's my pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much.